We're going to talk about marketing transformation and um, it is the internal capabilities of companies that uh, we are going to tackle as far as marketing and sales are concerned. And we have a couple of uh, key pillars that we're going to uh, address. The first is business processes, and Carty is going to talk to us about that, but I'm going to give you some more information. The workforce um, within the marketing transformation era, uh, Tarin will have a go at that. The supply chain within companies will be addressed by Manish, and customer experience will be a joint pony um, uh, what is it, Pony and Horse, uh, a show between, is that what it is, between Vatsal and myself. Good, let's kick off. The first pillar is the core business processes that is within a company. And it is bringing together business processes and analytics in real time to be smarter, faster, and simpler. And we've heard about that all day. But there's a reality check. 87% of finance executives agree that meeting growth targets require faster data analysis, but only 12% are able to respond to information requests in real time. I want to ask Carty, uh, who is heading marketing for a very large private bank, what your take is on how is running a business in real time, integrating predictive big data and mobile changing how we work and how information is being consumed. Carti, can you give us some sure. input on that? Uh, I'll start with uh, three tiny stories, hopefully. The first is about uh, uh, pin, pin numbers for your ATM cards. 17% of the PIN numbers we send out through the postal and courier system in this country come back undelivered. Frequently you get your debit card or your credit card, but the PIN doesn't reach you one out of five times. And that means that you don't use my card, you use my competitor's card, or you don't use a card at all and you use cash. And when, we, when in marketing we discovered this, we made a simple change to our mobile banking app and we allowed you to create your own PINs on the app. What this means is that all those 17%, in fact the full 100%, don't need to wait for their pin mailers to come anymore. This has delivered two business benefits to us. First, it has delivered the business benefit that you don't, I don't run the risk of you switching to competition because you didn't get my mailer. The second is that that time gap of delivery, which is minimum of a week, typically two weeks, you're transacting using my card, which means we are both in business, we're both dating steadily, we are getting into bed, and we turn into hopefully what's going to be a long marriage. So this is core business benefit, which has come out of data and insight, and it doesn't sound like big data, obviously, but when you pull back and look at it and we say on an annual basis it's what's happened to us, and we create a solution which is in the business process itself, I'd like to think of it as core marketing deliverable that has added to business ROI. Uh, there are similarly two other stories. One is related to the fact that for some reason that is inexplicable to me even today, we receive hundreds of thousands of phone calls from customers every day wanting to check their bank balance. We have 500 different ways in which you can check it, but all of them seem to be less attractive and less sexy than the ability to call us and ask us how much money is there in my account today. And why are you so worried about the money in your account on a daily basis, we don't know. But what we did to solve for it was, there is this other Indian insight around the missed call, which Valerie has created a big business out of, as we all know. And we took that missed call idea and we said, if all you want to know is your balance, just dial from your own mobile number this number and give us a missed call and pronto an SMS comes back to you with your balance, which is 99% of the time what you wanted. That single initiative is saving us 9 crores a year right now and we are projecting that it will save us 20 to 25 crores next year going forward. So oh, I'll stop at two examples if that's good enough for now. But I think it is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the second pillar that we're going to address is the workforce uh, within the industries, especially in the marketing industry. We have found that um, from uh, information from our recruitment agencies and placement agencies, that we haven't s sufficient qualified people within the digital age. 
and um, I think it is very important that we and that our staff and our employees know exactly uh, what is happening in the transformation of business. And often we find that the workforce doesn't think that marketing is part of what they should know. So the workforce engagement, improving workforce productivity is imperative for businesses. But the challenges of an increasing millennium worker and the fact that companies are increasingly turning to contractors and third party uh, services to provide the labor required uh, for a company. Tarun, you from a leading uh, Indian youngest media houses today, do you have some perspective on the changing workforce force dynamics and what companies like yours are doing to stay uh, competitive in this field? So yeah, it's an interesting uh, question. We are a service-based company and actually, uh, you know, uh, pretty much like uh, Karthi's business, we have really no plant and machinery to be proud of. <laughs> it's a standard, uh, you know, fare that's available to all our competition and really the only thing that differentiates uh, people like us is our people. Um, and you're right, you know, when we started, uh, I started this organization about 10 years ago and when we started we hired about 1,500 people uh, at one go. Uh, we got all sorts of people in and, and you know, we started an organization that we thought was going to be a great place to work or was going to be a highly motivated, charged up organization. You know, lo and behold, you, you learn a lot of uh, things as you go along and you realize that all that you put on paper about people, about their productivity, about efficiency doesn't come true on Excel sheets and Excel sheets are probably the easiest thing to make uh, uh, in, in business. So what did we do uh, to stand apart, to be different uh, and, you know, to be able to build ROI margin and uh, eventually end up being where we are? One of the key things I think we understood was what motivated people and what motivated people to perform their best. Uh, uh, so we started from an input measure uh, right at the time you recruit and hire people. Uh, and. Uh, you know, about three or four years ago, uh, we realized that you can motivate somebody when he's got some basic uh, features right or the basic values right uh, to build this organization with you. And we got in psychometric hiring, uh, a customized psychometric hiring process uh, into the organization. And we worked with a, a fairly uh, robust organization called SHL uh, that builds a customized or that built a customized recruitment, uh, you know, format for us. Uh, because, you know, your people are as good as the ones you hire. Uh, and once we got that right, right at every single level, we knew what, you know, what was right or wrong with every uh, employee of ours, even the existing or came, who, the ones who came in. And that made it much easier for us uh, to make sure that we had them motivated and, and we got them easier to perform. But still, you know, you can hire right and you can hire the ideal world in and, and what do you do with them post that. Uh, and so that was an interesting challenge. Uh, on how do you retain, how do you motivate, and, uh, and how do you make sure that, you know, you end up delivering to some of your uh, large uh, targets that you keep for yourself. And we used automation uh, at the second level as a key to uh, help our people perform better uh, and to be able to keep them uh, far more engaged. So at every aspect of our organization, we implemented a different kind of an automation tool that made their lives easier, simpler, uh, and got them to where they wanted to get to uh, much faster. So on, on, on the sales and marketing side, uh, we implemented uh, a backbone that helped them organize their life right from creating prospects, leads, to be able to, to track them, to be able to convert them far more easily, and to be able to track your own productivity and see where you're, you know, where you're going right, wrong, uh, and what you could alter to your own uh, you know, monthly operating or quarterly operating plan. And so we worked to customize with CRM Next an entire, uh, entire backbone that allowed people uh, to perform better and to measure their own success uh, on a daily basis. Even on, uh, you know, on our creative side, which is a large part of a, um, of a media company, uh, we actually created a backbone which captured as many uh, social insights. We used both social listening as well as, uh, you know, daily uh, social uh, trends that would come about 
to be able to feed into people what they could eventually feed out as content uh, on a daily basis. That enriched them or empowered them to be able to do better and to perform better. And we've seen that over a period of time, they're far more in touch with their audiences or their consumers and their ability to be able uh, to see how well or how worse they're doing is that much more easier. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, we've created a, a very strong internal feedback mechanism, uh, which is called the RAPS, um, which actually allows us to tinker with both our compensation strategy as well as our client-facing strategy on the basis of real-time feedback that we get from our, uh, from our frontline staff. Uh, that fed into most of the pricing mechanisms as well as uh, sales processes as well as content processes has led us uh, to be on a continuous, you know, evolving iterative process about, you know, how the organization work and what better, you know, things we can do to the organization. So both at the recruitment side, then at a daily process, technology backbone side and getting feedback and, and working on that, these three counts actually helped us to keep a motivated workforce and actually brought down our attrition levels by almost half over the last three or four years. I hope I've been able to I think that's, that's very comprehensive and uh, one of my largest clients in Johannesburg is a very large bank and we have found that um, the feedback from the customers through call centers, the automation processes that has been put in place, internal performances and so on, has done a great not only to bring new customers on board, but more importantly to retain customers across their life st stages and their life cycles within the bank. Thanks, that was very comprehensive. The third pillar in marketing motiva uh, uh, transformation is the supply chain. And Manish, I'm going to ask you to comment on that. What we do know today is that trillions of dollars uh, of commerce is moving in silos. Uh, and that connecting millions of partners and processing uh, bytes of data in real time is the core requirement uh, for us in the supply chain. And what we have found is that 50% of network companies are more likely than their peers to have increased sales, higher profit margins, and be a market leader, and have uh, built uh, better customer relations. It is out of a McKinsey report that this happened. Manish, can I ask you, as president of a company uh, that I believe is deeply rooted in the traditional supply chain cycle, can you tell us how processes have changed for you? Thanks. I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I've been working uh, in the building construction industry. Earlier I was selling paints, now sell uh, bathrooms. Uh, products uh, work for a brand called Hinware. Now, if I look back over the last 20, 30 years and how supply chain and consumer needs have evolved, uh, so 15 years back, uh, most people would paint their houses in you know, traditional colors of white, creams, etc. Today, companies on average give 2,500 colors. Uh, when we bought cars two decades back, you'd buy a white or a silver color card at most. Today, there are known 65,000 variants of colors available for the cars that you would have, depending on if a car is parked in Kerala or Delhi, or you know, same white, normally, you know, same white Maruti might have 250 variants. Now, this is all challenging for a manufacturing company, and uh, especially in a country like India where infrastructure is not evolved, you can't make products available, and if you do that, you're creating so much of inventory that your, you know, your businesses will not sustain itself. Now, uh, where what requires to be done there is use in uh, the right mix of technology in understanding what's happening on the ground, feeding it back to R&D and marketing to understand what would work and what would not work and make things obsolete. So for example, uh, you know, uh, if uh, a traditional way of somebody preparing a color for a car when it goes through an accident would be that they would take a petrol tank and get it mix and match and you'll keep some inventory around it. The non-traditional way is to use technology to pick up, digitally transfer the, the color code in its LRV value in the scientific uh, terms and send it back to uh, the central marketing and innovation team to define exactly what 
mix and match can do out of 90 products to deliver 65,000 colors. So, you know, effectively what you're doing is you're understanding what consumers need at the time of interception, using that to shift in the way you look at marketing uh, and product design, and then hence manage your inventory is far more effectively. In India, uh, you know, the Indian companies have done sort of much better than uh, the counterparts in Europe on this space, which is why if you compare Indian, uh, the same companies running businesses in India and running in Europe have virtually half the inventory. And we all know the complexity in India. Similarly, yeah, you know, if I give you another example of, uh, you know, the bathrooms industry, we work with 16,000 pieces. Now, uh, five years back, the companies would work with close to five months of inventory. What most companies, including ours, did was we started working with customers uh, and the people who recommend, you know, the people in our industry are architects who recommend what goes inside a house. And uh, we started picking early trends, converting that into a marketing information uh, to decide what will be becoming obsolete and what will become relevant. And hence start bottom slicing as you start introducing so products. So last year we launched close to 275 new products, which is virtually a product a day. But we also made close to 1,500 products redundant because we knew architects will not recommend it. So effectively, I think what it means for brick and mortar companies is understand at the point of interception, you know, as consumers go through their decision journey, they are talking to different people. They are talking to specifiers. They are talking to people who recommend friends, relatives, etc. Understand that trend and get into your supply chain uh, planning along with the marketing team and get the whole integrated planning right so you know what to be available and what not to be, which in today's world you can actually add to your margin and the bottom line. And I think that's something uh, to be watched out not only for us, but I think most for the brick and mortar companies. Good. Thank you. A good explanation on, uh, on the integration of silos and the benefits that it has to a company in all forms that there is. My passion, of course, is customer experience, uh, CRM, loyalty, and everything to do with customers. I think that um, they, today, more than ever de before, demand sim uh, simple, seamless integration with the company. They look at personalization. They want to be called by th their name and or their personas, uh, customized experiences, uh, and not only across one channel, but across all channels. And I've heard a lot about omni-channels today. Uh, and uh, very little about multi-channels, which I'm very pleased about that we're in the omni-channel world now. And the customer wants to be connected and be uh, in touch anytime, anywhere, and with any device. And I believe that that is what is giving us better and true customer experience and service. That's all. Will you kick off? And I also want to ask the rest of the panel to give us some idea of what should companies be doing to orchestrate processes across marketing, sales, and service to create this beautiful sympathy, sympathy and integration. I want to kick off by just saying the future of marketing is direct. We're in the now economy. We're in a human age. We've moved away from the industrial ages, and we're now in a human age. And all of this is through real-time strategies that is rooted in uh, data. That's all. Can you give us some examples? My association with Direct has been uh, about five years now. And uh, that was the time when this real time was the buzzword. So I'm talking about 2011. That's when globally DMAs uh, formally started uh, calling themselves as the Association for Data Driven Marketing and Advertising. And in those various meetings at the International Federation of DMAs, uh, something that was clearly seen coming was not only real time, but uh, uh, something to do with uh, preemptive marketing 
and this is also all our conference uh, is talking about. What what consumers really want to know is uh, they want to know the answers uh, even before they have themselves formed the questions, and that's that's the ma marketer's dilemma today. Uh, Google now is one such example of giving you answers and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, uh, uh, devices. Uh, uh, the the while while we are the human age, we are we are getting into the human and the AI age, and and that's blending in, and the pace of change is so rapid that by the time you thought of a strategy and e even are able to ro roll it out, the, the marketplace scenario has changed. The generation is looking for something else. Probably the, the new generation, uh, and the, the amount of variables the new generation is uh, having is, uh, is crazy. And who knows tomorrow's generation may want, uh, they may just want to uh, toss their one feet and uh, you know, order a pizza or a sub and it should be something like this. And, and, and those are the things. Uh, so it's it's even more interconnected. They want to. Uh, so consumers, we all know, are, are now having a larger voice. Uh, they are building the stories around the brands, and brands need to be listening to them. The the common challenges uh, still remain is uh, how do you integrate uh, the online experiences versus the offline experiences and the experiences uh, in between. Uh, and in in the common view around the ra many many roundtables that we have had at uh, DMA, m many marketers have opined that. Uh, it would be ideal to do a few things outstandingly well rather than trying to please the customer at uh, every meeting point. So, so that's the broad direction in sense of customer experience because uh, it requires a huge amount of resources to perfect every piece of the puzzle. But the most couple of critical pieces of the puzzle, if they are perfected well, it, it gives a great consumer experience. The brand gets to known for certain standards, and uh, that just uh, helps, I think. Thanks, Vatsa. Can I hear from the rest of the panel? Okay. Uh, again, I'll tell a story. Um, in the days of yore, when I opened my first bank account, most of us would go, have gone to a public sector bank, and we would have walked in, and we would have filled out a piece of paper, and the branch manager would, in turn, fill out a piece of paper, and he'd hand us a little book, which was called a passbook, and our bank account was up and running. Then automation came, and then what we all started to do was we'd have our sales guys go to the customer's house and collect all the KYC documents, fill out forms, do wet signatures, and then send it off to a central processing unit, which is in a remote, low-cost part of this country. And then if there were errors, they would come back to the sales guy, to the customer, and then do the journey again. So willy-nilly, thanks to automation and centralization, the account opening process from instant in the PSU age had become practically two weeks in the automated age. We're changing that now where we're putting tablets into our sales guys' hands. They're meeting the customer. They're taking photographs of every single document that's required, including the customer's face. They're filling all the data, typing it online on the tablet. Therefore, it's largely error-free. And then when they press send, it goes straight through into our system. An account number gets created. The customer gets his account number in two minutes. And across the table, we've handed over the debit card and checkbook. And we are seeing that this kind of instant is adding a great deal of value. Obviously, it's improving productivity just because we're able to please this customer today. She is used to instant gratification, practically everything else, and banking and financial services can't stay far behind, and we're doing that. Similarly, what we're using uh, some social media platforms for is not marketing. It's not as much as advertising as it is for service. So if you will tweet me, I will, of course, attend to your problem and solve your problem quickly, but if you tweet me, I can even deliver a book to you. So we've built that capability as well. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying that we want to be in play wherever money is moving from our customers' pockets into any other place and vice versa. So we want to be in that ecosystem and we want to enable that so that all those transactions happen painlessly for customers. So today about, I think about 10% of our transactions are airline bookings which are happening through our banking app itself. Similarly, people are booking hotels, people are booking movie tickets, and people are ordering books through Kotak. So we have become willy-nilly a bookstore meets an X meets a Y. And all of this is not about wanting to be all those things, wanting to be a marketplace. It's only about wanting to be an enabler for the customer's experience. But in the context of she finds the process of moving her money somewhat frictionful, somewhat fearful because of security concerns, etc. We're solving for those problems. But inter alia, what's happening is we're looking like a bookseller or we're looking like a cinema box office. That just happens to be the uh, apparition. But the experience really is much more friction-free, much more secure, and uh, obviously, hopefully, 
the more we do of this, the more uh, we stay in bed. I think that is a perfect example of leveraging all the information of your customers that you have. And uh, the role of technology is not to empower the sale, but to empower the customer. Nice thought there, uh, Kati. Manish? Yeah. I think I was reflecting and I complimented Andrew on his lovely presentation. And I said, look, when he talked about a similarity between <coughs> 1930s and you know, 2020, um, there's only one difference which I sort of picked up, which is when 1930s you went and bought something and the grocer recommended you certain things, that's the only piece of information that was available to you. You know, you knew, for example, if the grocer told you that uh, the best mangoes come from Mumbai, you didn't know they come from five other places. Now, when that information is today available, we all believe that consumer knows everything because he is Googling everything around. An excess of information also confuses consumers. When a consumer is going through a decision journey uh, and there's an excess of information available, uh, what marketers end up doing is, because they fear consumers know so much, they try and do what the other part of the film showed. You know, try and give him some solutions here and there, uh, assuming that they're trying to help him out. But what they don't understand is when you are bombarded with a lot of availability of information or choices, you actually need somebody to help you find a way out. And that's, if, and if I talk about Indian psychographics, you know, we normally call it people who want to help them find their style. More than 56% of Indians actually need somebody to hold, handhold them. So see a scenario where so much of information is available, the consumer is trying to find his way out, but he wants somebody to handhold. Now in this decision journey, if brands, and that's what we're trying to attempt in the work that we do is can have meaningful conversation with consumers to understand his needs and try and tell him, you know, this is exactly what you want. Can I help you reach to your journey faster and more easy? Uh, you, we believe you, you, you are able to convert a customer faster and get more money out of his pocket than the way that, you know, some of the films show. So that, I think, is a learning that uh, with a lot of information available in hand of marketeers, we need to be cautious about the fact that not ev knowing everything means you have the right approach to a consumer's pocket. You need to still find a way to help him out. I think uh, what Manish is talking about is also the problem that we as marketers are sitting where we are the uh, custodians and the guardians of customers' uh, privacy um, and the privacy issues. I'm not sure if you are settled with that, but it is very big in our countries and uh, Europe as well as uh, America. And it's a three-way battle that all marketers are fighting. The rights to privacy, drive for re relevance and preferences, and the fight for permission. I'm amazed to find out from many of our clients and last night I looked at databases from my company again of our clients where we have a million clients but we have a 12 percent permission uh, that we can talk to them. What is your take in the last uh, couple of minutes on what is the, the uh, per, uh, privacy issues, uh, preferences and permission in your country and in your industry. Will you kick off? Um, okay. Carty, you probably. So I think uh, Louisa put up a slide earlier today saying that Indians are very brazen with their data and we are not so fast. And this is absolutely true. You have to take a long distance train journey in this country and you'll discover that before the train has left the city, you know everything about your co passenger, including which of their daughters are of marriageable age, what their incomes are, and so on. And I think this is, uh, it speaks to the culture of India, and it's in a context, obviously, and privacy as a concern, quite likely, will grow as we mature in some senses. But uh, what we are seeing, certainly, is that our customers are not that fussed about privacy. Having said that, we are very careful. What I mean by that is, for example, that we don't sell or rent our customer data to any partner of ours. Wherever we do partner marketing, it is certainly fully protected and we are the ones communicating on behalf of the partner to our customer. We don't buy databases either for that same reason. All list brokers don't need to call us and they know that. So we are working fully in the context of permission only. And it's, in some senses, we are ahead of our times for this country. And sure, we're leaving money on the table because of that and 
I'm painfully aware of that, and some of my sales and marketing colleagues uh, constantly badger us saying that you're holier than the Pope for no reason whatsoever, because there is this Indian mindset that says, I don't care, hit me. In fact, we get a lot of, Kotak is in such an aggressive brand because you're not spamming the hell out of me. <laughs> but we'd rather be first man standing in this particular conversation and wait for things to be right. That's our philosophy at least. And you? Uh, most organizations tend to take uh, privacy issues and customer data. We, we started doing this about a year ago on our radio station where anybody who calls in actually goes through a call center and gives us most information that we ask for about him and we've created a loyalty uh, stroke database club. Uh, but and we have then we have advertisers who come to us saying, can we use this database? Can we do stuff with this database? And 99.9% .9 of time, until we think that it's worth for our listeners to get engaged with a product like this, we don't allow access to that, uh, to that database. That database is of people who trust us, who come to us, who, who listen to us, who love our station, who want to interact with our content and stuff like that. But it's not open for spamming or it's not open for advertiser benefit. But there's a, you know, there's a good example of something we did very recently. Um, so, you know, a telecom brand came to us and they said that we want to uh, create this whole, you know, digital India uh, a 